I am convinced that taking the time to watch our medical missionary seminar will prove to be of benefit to you and your church. Our desire is that the presentations you will be seeing will encourage, inspire, and enable you to be better equipped for service in this day. Our world is in a third year of a global health crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. As we know, it is an extremely contagious virus that is replicating and continues to mutate. It has created division in our society, in families and in churches. Fear of social occasions and the spread of the virus has affected the mental stamina of many, and the enemy has used it to discourage the unprepared. Many of our own believers have been stricken with COVID, and some have suffered more severely than others. Our hearts break with the grieving families of the loved ones that have been laid to rest, but we wait the blessed resurrection. Through this disheartening circumstances, God's people must arise, unitedly take up their post as medical missionaries, yes, even at such a time as this. I am so grateful that God has given us the opportunity to discuss this subject of medical missionary work. As Seventh-day Adventist Reformers, we have been blessed with a health message the likes of which our world has never seen before. God, in His mercy, has bestowed on His people, through His prophet, a treasure of truth that relates to the care and the function of our bodies. It is high time to read, study, and apply these principles taught in the writings of Sister White. In His loving provision, God has entrusted the health message, the right arm of the threefold angel's message, to his church. How privileged we are! But with every trust comes responsibility. We are to be heralds of the health message to the world. To be truly successful, we must learn from the ministry methods of our precious Savior Jesus Christ. The more we embrace Christ as the model medical missionary, the better we will be able to pattern our lives after His methods and minister effectively to meet the current needs of humanity. Historically, in 1860, the life expectancy was only 39.4 years. In the 19th century, the world was ravaged with diseases. Epidemics included smallpox, typhus, yellow fever, and scarlet fever. By the dawn of the 19th century, tuberculosis or consumption had killed one in seven of all the people living in the United States and Europe. According to the World Health Organization in 2019, tuberculosis is still a primary cause of death and a leading cause of infection, killing 1.4 million people. Medical care was still very primitive, with bloodletting being practiced until the late 19th century. This practice was prescribed for many conditions and was practiced for thousands of years. We are reminded of the United States President George Washington and his treatment by doctors that involved substantial bloodletting that hastened to his death at the young age of only 67. In 1861, Louis Pasteur published his germ theory, which proved that bacteria caused diseases. During the century of health care dysfunction, Ellen White blessed the world with our beautiful health message. The timeless principles which God revealed to his servants have been supported by evidence-based research in our time. The first 
major health vision given to Ellen White was on June 6, 1863 in Otsego, Michigan, during family worship. The church was organized only a few weeks before, on May 21st, and already God was revealing health principles through Ellen White for improving health and longevity. It has taken decades for medicine to catch up with the lifestyle principles preserved for us in her books. Research has established that Adventists that are vegetarians and follow healthy lifestyle principles have a longer lifespan. This fact is directly related to the health message given by Ellen White. I am convinced that the light revealed in true science, in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, is beneficial only as it is accepted and followed. As these principles are practiced in our lives and in our homes, lifelong benefits will be realized. Three years after Ellen White's first major health vision, the Western Health Reform Institute was founded. It was in a vision on Christmas Eve that Ellen White saw that Adventists were to pioneer a health institution of their own. James and Ellen White were founding members, and in 1875, John Kellogg joined the staff of the Western Health Reform Institute. By 1878, a new medical and surgical sanatorium stood on the ground of the old institution. The Battle Creek Sanatorium, as it was then called, was destroyed in a fire in 1902. It was quickly rebuilt in a much larger manner against the counsel of Ellen White. In its day, it was the largest medical facility of its kind in the world. People flocked to this health institution from all over the United States and Europe. The facility was graced by such famous people as John D. Rockefeller, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Amelia Earhart, Warren G. Harding, and Booker T. Washington. With a staff of up to 1,000, the facility had treatment rooms capable of holding more than 1,000 participants. The glory days of the San, as it was officially called, did not last forever. In 1933, the 14-story tower went into receivership. In 1953, the General Hospital was closed, and in 1986 saw the main building raised to the ground, ending the final chapter in the history of the Battle Creek Sanitarium. While it is no longer in existence today, there is something greater that has stood the test of time. In the writings of Ellen White, we have a legacy of information supported by science on health, living, and how to attain a healthful lifestyle. Her writings are a precious treasure to be studied, understood, and shared with the world. Dear viewer, it is worth examining the key principles encapsulated in her books. It is my desire to introduce to you some of her writings. I believe the book Ministry of Healing is one of her most precious gifts to the world. It was written in 1905 and is considered her most comprehensive work on health and healthful living. Many precious statements that are very well known to us are found in this book. Some examples are, God never leads his children otherwise than they would chose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning. Page 479. Saving faith is a transaction. Page 62. Read about the greatest miracle found on page 89. Christ's methods alone will give true success in reaching people found on page 143. We are never called 
to make a real sacrifice for God. We are but giving up that which hinders us in the pathway heavenward. Page 473. Why not make it a point to read this book along with the Desire of Ages annually? You won't regret it. As you immerse yourself in her writings, you will become transformed. They are transformational. These and others of her books are available in various formats. Online, written page, and narrated form. Let's use our time wisely and redeem every moment by filling our minds with enduring principles that benefit us. Ellen White's book, Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, printed in 1890, presents in the first 162 pages basic health principles. Parts of these health principles were 15 years later incorporated into her book, Ministry of Healing. Nine chapters of this book were reprinted in 1923 in Councils on Health. One of my favorite books is Healthful Living. This book is amazing. Make sure you have it in your library. In 1897, Sister White was in Australia. Dr. David Paulson, then working at the Battle Creek Sanitarium, compiled together Ellen White's writings in topical order. If you re want to read what she wrote on a particular subject, like exercise, diet, the lungs, the skin, stomach, etc., this book is a valuable tool. While the broad principles of healthful living had been set forth in the Ministry of Healing, many additional health messages are contained in Ellen White's articles, journals of the church, testimonies for the church, and certain out-of-print books. These contain health principles of a health-instructive nature that benefit the church and the world. The materials assembled by the White Trustees in the book Councils on Health, published in 1923, are here exhibited in this book. This book is of great service to the church, especially to health care workers. Ellen White wrote more in the field of health than on any other single topic. Many of her manuscripts were addressed to physicians, nurses, and institutional managers. These councils embody vital and important health principle. The book Medical Ministry, released in 1932, is primarily a selection of these councils addressed to medical personnel. So that we might benefit from them, they have been compiled for our education. The preface of this book is written by A.G. Daniels, then president of the General Conference and one of the trustees chosen by Mrs. White to care for her writings. Decades before physiologists understood the close relationship between diet and health, Ellen White pointed out this connection. In 1926, Dr. Walton, a professor of nutrition at Loma Linda University, assembled Ellen White's materials from published and unpublished sources relating to the subjects of diet and food. This material was topically arranged for ready reference in a paperback textbook called Testimony Studies on Diet and Foods. The interest was so widespread that the original book was supplemented by new material and a new expanded edition was issued in 1938 entitled Councils on Diet and Foods. This book includes a full range of instruction from Ellen White on the subject of diets and foods. A number of more current Ellen White compilations are available on other healthcare subjects that can be accessed online 
in a variety of formats. It is my hope and my desire that as we read and study the works of Ellen White, that we will be blessed by a more comprehensive knowledge and a deeper respect for the wonderful health message that has been entrusted to us by God. Imagine the impact each one of us can have in 2022 during this global pandemic if we share these relevant health principles with our friends and neighbors. At the time where there is fear, confusion, and uncertainty, our health message is reliable. It is a beacon of light and hope. We are not affected by the confusion and misinformation that is being disseminated all around us. We have a message that has stood the test of time. Pandemics and other world crises have not necessitated a revision of what God has given to his church. What has proven successful in meeting the challenges of our times is the application of the health principles given to us through Ellen White by God. And now I wish to invite you to my home church where we're going to look at some of the beautiful texts and references that Ellen White has on the subject of medical missionary work. We have just considered from a historical perspective the writings of Ellen White as they relate to the beautiful health message that she gave to us and to our church. And now we would like to consider some references from the spirit of prophecy as they relate to medical missionary work. She uses a metaphor in her writings quite often, the metaphor of the right arm relating to medical missionary work. This is a very interesting metaphor because the right arm is, especially if we are right-handed, our best arm. With our right arm and our right hand, we do so many different things. We eat, we write, and we do all of those motions and those skilled activities that require dexterity and fine movements. Truly, the right arm, the arms of man, have created so many things in our world today. And so the right arm as the medical missionary arm is an interesting study. Medical missionary work is the right hand of the gospel. It is necessary to the advancement of the cause of God. As the right hand of the third angel's message, God's methods of treating diseases will open doors for the entrance of present truth. The right arm, the right hand opens doors for the entrance of present truth. Have you ever wondered why sometimes present truth cannot enter, cannot penetrate? Could it be that we are not utilizing, we are not engaging our right arm to open doors for the entrance of present truth? Could it be that our right arm is disabled or that our right arm, is it a sling, that it is dysfunctional or inoperable? The Lord desires his church to be a perfect body. Everything that God made is perfect. When he created man and he looked at his creation, he says, very good. And so he wants his church. He wants his church to be a perfect body. Not all arms, not all body without arms, but body and arms together. Every member working as one great whole. As the right arm is connected to the body, so the health reform and medical missionary work is connected with the third angel's message and is to work efficiently. I would like to pause on that word efficiently. The right arm 
medical missionary work and the third angel's message are to work together efficiently as the right harm for the defense of the body of truth. Sometimes we wonder, why is our truth so defenseless, so vulnerable? Could it be that we have not engaged the right arm in defense of the body of truth? We need to use our best arm, our dominant arm, skillfully to defend truth from the attacks that are all around, to tear down and to destroy truth as it is found in Jesus. There are some fun facts about the arm, about the hands. There are quite a few bones in the wrist. There are 27 bones in the wrist and hand, and 54 bones altogether. What is also interesting is that the arm and the bones of the arm are the bones that are most frequently broken. There's no other bones in the body that are broken as frequently as are the bones of the arm. That makes me think, are the right arm elements of our churches sometimes dysfunctional? Do we have broken medical missionary departments in our churches and in our fields? I know that in churches there are many departments that are very strong. We have the Sabbath school department, very functional, very strong. We have the music department, we have the youth department, and we should have the medical missionary department. But is the medical missionary department disabled? Is it in a sling? Or is it functional and operational in defense of truth? The hands are a very beautiful structure. They're composed of so many tissues and elements to give them the capacity to do what they need to do. They have 29 joints, 123 ligaments, 34 muscles, 48 nerves, and 30 arteries. All of these elements are found in our hands so that they can function skillfully in a manner to God's honor and glory. As we look at the hands and the arms and what they're all comprised of, we're amazed at God's creation. How all of those things, ligaments, muscles, nerves, bones, all of those things function together harmoniously, skillfully, to be able to accomplish all of the things that our hands are called in action to do. It's an also an interesting fact that our arm is composed of three bones. Three bones make up our arm. There are also three angels' messages in our three angels' message. I don't think that's coincidental. An interesting fact. Three angels' message, three bones in the arm. Now, for the arm and the hand to function, there needs to be a lot of brain geography dedicated to controlling the function of the arm. For that fact, about 25%, about one quarter of the brain motor cortex is dedicated to arm and hand function. That's a lot of geography from a motor cortex perspective controlling that. Also from a sensory perspective, a large percent of our sensory geography in our brain is dedicated <clears throat> to the sensory components of our hands and arms so that they can feel the light touch, so that the fingers have proprioceptive feedback, so that they can discriminate all of those things that our hands are so adept at doing. All of these things are there to allow the hand and the arm to be the tool that it is in our world. I pray to God that the right arm in our church will also have dedicated to its usefulness a great percent of 
cognitive thinking, reasoning, logic, all of those things that are necessary to control and to manage medical missionary work in our churches. This way, it is not a haphazard uh, department. It is not something that works in a manner that is not clearly thought out, but is functioning under the control of reasoning, of thinking, of cognitive function. So who is called to be a medical missionary? Who has God called? Is it an exclusive group of people or is it all inclusive? Is medical missionary work only dedicated to healthcare providers, to those who are trained in the healthcare field? Let us read what the servant of the Lord tells us on this subject. We have come to a time, she says, when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. It is all inclusive. Every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Christ is no longer in this world in person to go through our cities and towns and villages healing the sick. He has commissioned us to carry forward the medical missionary work that he began. God has commissioned us to carry forward the work that he began when he was here on earth. And that includes everyone in all of our churches. So what is medical missionary? Medical missionary work is the pioneer work. It is to be connected with the gospel. It is the gospel in practice. The gospel practically carried out. What a beautiful statement. Medical missionary work is the gospel in practice. It is the gospel practically carried out. That is what our world needs to see. Theory is important. Knowledge is important. But practical gospel carried out is what the world is needing to see. How can we express in a practical way the gospel, the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ? We should ever remember that the object of medical missionary work is to point sin-sick men and women to the man of Calvary. The purpose of medical missionary work is to direct or is to point sin-sick men and women to the man of Calvary, to Jesus Christ, who taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus is the great physician. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the model medical missionary. And all of what we do exclusively needs to point to Jesus Christ, not to self or anything that we can do. The lesson that we need to learn is, what is true medical missionary work in practical lines? Let us keep before the people everywhere the terms of eternal life. So how should medical missionaries act? We should be humble servants. Self is to be humbled, not exalted. Medical missionary work is not a self-elevating, self-centered work. It is a humbling work. It is of great consequence that all who claim to understand the gospel of medical missionary work teach the principles of truth. Humbly, teach the principles of truth. May God give us humility, as was exemplified in Jesus Christ. When he was here on earth, he humbled himself and served those in need. So the true medical missionary, what is the true medical missionary? The medical missionary is a teacher giving instruction in the principles of healthful living, using a knowledge of, this is interesting, a knowledge of what? In our colleges and in our institutions of higher learning, there are so many subjects that are considered very important 
and very necessary for life in our world and to be successful. But to be a successful medical missionary, these two subjects are very important. A knowledge of physiology and hygiene as the basis of all education. Very interesting comment. The basis of all education is what? Physiology and hygiene. Teach the people that it is better to know how to keep well than how to cure disease. Teach the people how to keep well than how to cure disease. Sometimes I cringe when at health retreats or health meetings, we focus on treating diseases, cancer, heart disease. We focus on diagnosing and treating all of these diseases when really the emphasis should be on prevention, on prevention, not cure. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. May God help us to understand where our emphasis needs to be. That's why we've been given such beautiful health principles, health laws, that if incorporated, will help prevent illnesses. Our physicians should be wise educators, warning all against the indulgence of self. Now, the very best work you can do is to come close to people, says Ellen White, as close as possible and reveal in life and character the work wrought upon your own soul. Yes, this is what we're called to do at this time, at this COVID time, to come close to people, to come close to people. I'm not speaking now physically, but I'm going to speak now metaphorically. We can come close to people in so many different ways, using our senses, where we can reveal in life and character and work what God has wrought for us. How can we come close to people? By listening. We need to listen to people so they feel that they are understood. We can use our sight and perceive, see people's needs, what they're needing, how they're hurting. We can come close to people in a sensory capacity where we feel their heartache, their hurt, and their fear. And if we have been with Jesus Christ, we will reveal in our own life and in our own character what Christ has wrought in our own souls. And this will be practical religion. The Divine Commission needs no reform. Christ's way of presenting truth cannot be improved upon. So <clears throat> the methods Christ gave and the methods Christ used need no modification, no improvement. What did he do? He sympathized with the weary, the heavy laden, the oppressed. He fed the hungry and he healed the sick. Constantly he went about doing good. By the good he accomplished, by his loving words and kindly deeds, he interpreted the gospel. Jesus Christ interpreted the gospel by the things he did. He fed the hungry. He sympathized with those who were hurting. He healed the sick. He went about doing good. Dear brother and sister, these are things God is calling you and me to do, to follow in his steps, to interpret the gospel of Jesus Christ through these medical missionary opportunities. All around us are heard the wails of a world's sorrow. We hear the moans of a hurting and sorrowing world. On every hand are the needy and the distressed. It is ours to aid in relieving and softening life's hardships and misery. The wants of the soul only the love of Christ can satisfy. If Christ is abiding in us, our hearts will be full of divine sympathy. The sealed fountains of earnest Christ-like love will be unsealed. Beautiful things 
pointed out here that we can be the hand and feet of Christ extended. On every hand, there are sorrowing and needy people. We can relieve them. There is so much roughness and hardness in the world today. We can relieve that by our softening applications of God's principles in life. And if Christ is abiding in our hearts, we're going to have that divine sympathy, that Christ-like love. Now, in treating diseases... In our world today, there are various procedures and various modalities that can be applied to the sick in order to relieve suffering. As medical missionaries, God has given us also modalities that are of a healing nature. There are many from whom the hope has departed. What are we told to do? Bring back the sunshine to them. We're living in a dark world. Bring back sunshine. Many have lost their courage. What can we do? Speak to them words of cheer. Speak to the hurting, fearful people around us. Words of cheer. Pray for them. There are those who need the bread of life. Read to them the word of God. We are not illiterate, we're able to read. Let's share with the world around us the word of God, the pure, unadulterated word of God. Read to them. Upon many is a soul sickness which no earthly balm can reach, nor physician heal. Pray for these souls. Bring them to Jesus. Bring them to Jesus. Tell them. There is a balm in Gilead and a physician there. Oh, these beautiful, practical, medical, missionary modalities can be applied and can be used by each and every one of us. God has been waiting for a long time. He's been waiting for the spirit of service to take possession of the whole church so that everyone shall be working for him according to his abilities. God is waiting. He's waiting for everyone in the whole church to work according to his abilities. When God calls, he also enables. God will enable you and strengthen you to serve according to your ability. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. God is waiting for you and me to respond to the call. And today, in the person of his children, he visits the poor and needy, relieving woe and alleviating suffering. Today, he wants to work with you and through you to relieve all the poor and needy from all of the suffering that they're experiencing in our hurting world. Christ is no longer here in person on the earth to go through the cities and the towns. So what has he done? He has commissioned us to carry forward medical missionary work that he began. He began the medical missionary work. He was the first one. And he desires that we do our very best. He wants to work through us. He wants to commission us to take hold of this task. And now the Bible text that we find in Isaiah is a very powerful text that I believe God is speaking to you and to me right now today. Listen to what he says to you. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, Lord Send me. It is my hope and desire that you will respond to this invitation. Who will go? 
and you will respond by saying, Here am I, send me. It is my hope and desire that we engage as medical missionaries in a new, fresh, and engaging way to serve the world that is around us so that Jesus may come soon. My wish and prayer is the Lord may bless you and me to accept this call today. Amen.